I remember back when I was 22, no, no, way, way back, so long ago, uh, fresh out of college, and I, uh, I had just graduated from Concordia, Nebraska in December, and my wife and I had about an eight-month gap before we were going to leave to go to Concordia Seminary. And so I'm living back at home with my parents, and, and I need to find work for these eight months. And so I remember I'm sitting at this desk across from this younger lady, and she's interviewing me for this job, this contract work for an insurance company. And, and she's telling me all the details about the job, you know, what I'm going to be doing, the pay, all that sort of stuff. But then at the end of the interview, I ask her this question. I ask... So tell me about your company culture. And I bet you might be able to guess what she said. Let's see if you can fill in the blank here. She said, we are like a family here. That's right. We are like a family. I mean, so many companies use this description for their culture. I mean, I was even, uh, I was a couple days ago watching a preseason football game and they're interviewing this Bengals player and they're asking why he likes it so much on, in Cincinnati now. And he's like, man, we're, we're like a family here. Like this description, it, it's used all the time, family, family. And I think it's because we, we write family, this tight knit community, this, this unity that we have, that's what we're like here. And yet it's interesting because uh, research is coming out that warning against companies actually using this as a description for, for their work culture. And I found this article in The Atlantic called The Dark Side of Calling Your Company Culture Family. And, and listen to what it says here. When someone says that their workplace is like a family, they want you to be impressed. We share a special bond, they imply. We look out for one another and are effortlessly in sync. But as a journalist covering work and families, I can't help but notice another entirely unintended meaning in this common corporate metaphor. Work is like a family in many unhealthy, manipulative, and toxic ways. It goes on. When I hear something like, we're like a family here, I silently complete the analogy. We'll foist obligations upon you, expect your unconditional devotion, disrespect your boundaries, and be bitter if you prioritize something above us. Many families are dysfunctional. Likening them to on-the-job relationships inadvertently reveals the ways in work can, work can be too. <laughs> that is a tough description of family, and yet I'm sure there's some of you here when you heard those words, many families are dysfunctional, inwardly you're like, yep, I know exactly what that is. The reality is that family in our culture, it's not what it used to be, whereas family used to be this place that was kind of this bedrock for unity and stability and community. Like no matter how bad the outside world got, you always knew you had unity and community there. And yet, fast forward to today, and, and that's just no longer the case. More research is coming out of that. I think the number is above 50% of children born today are projected to grow up in broken households. And that's something that should, one, just absolutely grieve us. But what we see is, is now people, what, what they used to look to family for this unity, and now we're scattering Scattering like sheep, looking, where, where is my flock? Where do I belong? Where do I find that true sense of unity and community that we're all yearning for? We all have it. And so we're all running, trying to find what is going to satisfy that longing for community. Well, today we're, we're diving back into the Gospel of John. And my hope today is that one, we would acknowledge that yearning for community each one of us has. Two, see why what the world is offering to satisfy that, why it can't satisfy. And why true community, true unity can only be found in the good shepherd. It can only be found in Jesus. So let's dive into this. So Jesus, he's telling, uh, he's, he uses this another I am statement, and in it, he talks about a threat that is coming. He says there's a threat coming to the sheep, and this threat is a wolf. 
And Jesus says the purpose of this wolf is to attack the sheep and then ultimately scatter them. That's what the wolf wants to do is scatter the sheep. And the first thing this should do for us is make us realize that Satan's goal is to drive each and every one of you into isolation. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants us to be uh, in this trapped place of loneliness. And yet, whether you're, you know, religious or secular, everyone can agree that loneliness isn't a good thing. Like, I don't think anyone's sitting here like, you know what? That whole, that whole COVID thing, I think we were on to something there. What, hear me out. What if, what if we just isolated from each other all the time? Yeah. No, no one's saying that. We all recognize that's not good for us in that community. It's not just a nice thing. It's actually essential to who we are. We, we need it. And so now the question is, who are the sheep going to look to to protect against this wolf, this attack of loneliness? Because if there's one thing we know about sheep, it's sheep can't protect themselves. Right? And, and so we got to realize we can't protect ourselves from loneliness. We always have to look to something else. And so the question is, where are the sheep going to look to? Jesus gives two options. The first one is a hired hand. Now, back in those days, a hired hand is someone who would be brought in to take care of the sheep for a limited amount of time. They'd be given a, a sum of money to, to uh, kind of step in the place of the shepherd and take care of the sheep. But uh, a few things we got to realize about a hired hand is, one, they're not bad people. They're, you know, they're, they're not these evil person. No, they're, they're someone brought in to do a job. And because of that, a hired hand doesn't have the deep care for the sheep like the shepherd does because they're not, they're not his sheep. The hired hand is only there because he's getting something out of the sheep. He's getting paid to be there. And so what Jesus says about these hired hands, he says a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't there Shepherd, and so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. This should get us thinking uh, if in this whole analogy, right, we're the sheep. So the question is what, what in our world, what in our culture? are we looking to, to satisfy this yearning for community, to protect us from this attack of loneliness that are only hired hands? There was an article that came out uh, written by Karen Turner in Vox, and it was called The Church, Secularism, and Where Americans Are Finding Community. And listen to what she says here. American secularism is on the rise. 24% of Americans don't affiliate with any religion, according to a 2016 Public Religion Research Institute survey, which is up eight percentage points in the past five years. Nowhere is this trend away from religion greater than in younger generations, where more than a third of people ages 18 to 29 are unaffiliated, compared to just over 10% of people ages 65 and up. And this shouldn't be surprising to us, but here's the part I really want you to focus on. But without religion, traditionally a source of community, purpose, and moral teaching, how are unaffiliated Americans filling this void? Some have suggested that increasingly tribal political identities have taken the traditional space of religion, along with fitness, exercise classes, and workism or careerism. And others think we simply might not be replacing organized religion with anything in particular, making us lonelier and more disconnected. There's really three big places that I see our world running to to try to satisfy that yearning for deep community. And these three places are political ideologies, careers, and social media platforms. And the reality is none of these things are bad things in and of themselves. Uh, but the problem is if we start as sheep, start to look to those things to bring us true community, true belonging. The reality is those are only hired hands. What do I mean by this? 
Let's say you find your sense of belonging and community in your political party. You know, I am a Republican, I am a Democrat. When you profess that, that group is gonna embrace you. They're gonna embrace you with open arms, you're gonna be brought in, you're, and you, man, you're gonna feel such a, a great sense of community. You're like, this is, this is where I belong. This is the community I've been searching for. As long as you perfectly conform to the ideologies and beliefs of that group. You see, in any of those groups, as soon as maybe your beliefs start to differ, or maybe, maybe that bad part of you gets revealed, uh, some, you mess up, suddenly you're kicked out. I mean, that's cancel culture in a nutshell, right? You no longer are a good person that fits in to the community. And the rea- thing we got to realize with any one of these things is that in each of these things, you're not a part of the community because of who you are. You're a part of the community because of what you give to the community. You know, a political party wants you part of that community so they can have your vote. <laughs> a job wants you part of their community so they can get a job done, right? Right? A social media plat, you know, an influencer, let's say, they want you a part of their community so they can get more followers. And so while none of these things are bad in and of themselves, if you're looking to that for, for deep, true community, the reality is, thing, the reality is all these things are a me- they use you for a means to an end. You don't belong just because of who you are. It's because of what you give to the community. And if you don't give what they want, you're out. So where do we find... Where do we find true community? Community that, that transcends these barriers, these dividers that the world sets up. Where do we look to? Well, the reality is that true unity needs two things. It needs both authority and sacrifice. Whatever you're looking to for, for true community, it needs both those things. Because if you have authority without sacrifice, and that's what a lot of groups in our world today try to go to, right? It's just, we're going to f- build community by, by grabbing for power. The reality is, you start to just build a group of like-minded people, people who all look the same, behave the same, believe the same thing, and if you're not a part of that, you're out, so we just need to get rid of those bad outsiders and just, get, just focus on our inward circle. And the reality is that's not a community, that's a club. And if we're being honest, there's times where the church has looked like that. Where it's just a, people who all just live good moral lives and we're all the same and, 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 we don't, and we just start to neglect the outsider. You're not welcome here because you don't look exactly like us. That's what happens when you have authority, but no sacrifice, no care for the outsider, those who think differently, look differently than you. Uh, You don't have any care for the person who doesn't normally belong in that community. There was a quote I heard about unity here that says, the unity of a nation's spirit and will are worth far more than the freedom of the spirit and will of an individual. And that the higher interests involved in the life of the whole must here set the limits and lay down the duties of the interests of the individual. And man, we hear that, we're like, that sounds great, right? The sacrifice individual for the sake of unity, this is great. Until we realize those words were spoken by Adolf Hitler. You see, this is the example of what happens when you try to bring about unity through authority, but no sacrifice. It's all about power, getting people who are, who are like each other and not caring for the outsider. There's no crossing the dividers. You're just building up walls through seeking power. But what happens if we try to go for community with sacrifice, but you don't have the authority? Well, I know uh, one of the most tragic days in American history was 9-11. I still remember to this day, that morning, I was real young, walking down and seeing my mom just staring at the TV screen and, and tears just coming down from her eyes at the horror that was happening in front of her. 
And it's just one of the most tragic days in American history. Thousands of people lost their lives. And yet the thing that stood out to me that day was watching those firefighters, those rescue workers sprinting straight into those burning buildings, knowing that, that they would likely lose their life, and many of them did, but they were doing it to save their fellow American. And it's interesting because you talk to many historians about what followed that day. And they'll tell you that America was more unified that following year than it had been in, in recent memory. People set aside their divisions to come around this, this sacrifice that had happened of suddenly all these things that once divided us, it didn't matter anymore. We were all fellow Americans together. And this sacrifice, it sparks unity. And that unity lasted for a little while. But we know that unity, it faded away. And we fast forward to today, and now our country once again seems more divided than ever. You see, that event, it had sacrifice. That sacrifice did spark unity, but it didn't have the authority, the power to make that unity transcend, to make it last, to make it go on beyond uh, the sinful barriers and dividers that we put up. And so where do we look to? Where's the place that has both the authority and the power to, to bring lasting unity and yet also the sacrifice to look to the outsider, to welcome them in and to transcend those barriers that is only found in the good shepherd? Not a hired hand. We need the good shepherd. We need Jesus to bring that because Jesus, you see, he combines both ultimate authority, right? We heard that in the Isaiah reading. He has ultimate authority, but he combines it with ultimate sacrifice. Jesus has ultimate authority. The, the Bible says, all, you know, all, the whole world was created through him. All power is already in his hands. He doesn't have to go grasp for power like, like communities in this world. It's already his. And yet he takes all the power in the world and he uses it to bring ultimate sacrifice. With that power, Jesus, he, he created each and every one of you. And he knows you and he wants to know you and he wants you to know him. He, doesn't just, he didn't just create you to get something from you or to coerce you. No, he wants to know you. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me just as my father knows me, and I know the father. Jesus really knows you. Jesus really knows you. He knows the filth. He knows the junk. He knows the darkness. Those things that communities of this world, if they, if they see that, you're out. And yet where all these other communities run away, Jesus sees the very same thing that disqualifies you from the communities of this world. And rather than running away, he draws near. Jesus says, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there'll be one flock with one shepherd. How do you know that you can trust Jesus? Unlike communities of this world, trust Jesus to deliver the, the unity, the community that you're yearning for. It's because Jesus, he's all in. He's all in. He gave everything for you. He is fully committed. He saw, he saw you in all of your brokenness, and rather than running away, he came down from heaven. He became like you. He, he suffered like you. He laid down his life for you so that you could be part of this one flock. He's the true shepherd. He doesn't welcome you because of what you do for him. He welcomes you because you are his. You belong to him. That is what defines this community in Jesus. The reason Christianity is so radical and so different than anything in this world is because Christianity is founded upon this principle, where you are welcome not because of what you do for us, but because of what Christ has done for you. And when we let that reality start to transform our hearts, 
this community, it changes everything. Because now the, the barriers of this world no longer apply. Instead, it's only what the good shepherd says. We welcome who the good shepherd welcomes. We love who the good shepherd loves. We forgive who the good shepherd forgives. And when the world steps in and says, no, 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 you, you can't associate with that person because they look differently than you, they speak differently than you, they uh, have a different economic status than you, they vote differently than you, the good shepherd steps in front and says, no, that is my sheep. That is someone I laid down my life for. They belong to me. They are mine. And when you realize that that's not only how the good shepherd views people in this world, but that's how he views you, it changes everything. And I pray that our community here would be a reflection of our good shepherd, welcoming in to one flock true unity where all are welcome, even you and even me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this world constantly is trying to put up dividers and barriers to tell us we uh, can't love that person, we can't associate with that person, but Lord, you've shattered all barriers and that is, that is founded at the cross. The cross brought down all walls and now, now we can be a community that is unlike anything in this world because it's a community that doesn't doesn't ask something from us, but it's a community of Christ putting his identity on us, claiming us, telling us we are his. That is true for each and every person here, and I pray that that reality would come over them and be flow, flowing out into each one of their relationships. All else we pray in your name, Jesus, the good shepherd. Amen.